Hello friends. I just made a short video on baptism. It's actually an email that I was writing to somebody. And I figured I would share this video with you. I recorded it outside on the lawn this morning with my phone while reading what I'd written. And so now I'm adding this little intro section to the beginning of it to, so that you understand what I'm even doing. But yeah, it's a long, exhaustive um, study of sorts on what does the Bible have to say about baptism? How does that compare to uh, what we perhaps have grown up learning about it? And so forth. So I hope you find it very interesting. Enjoy. Hi. So I thought it would be a good idea to write down what I believe about water baptism. Especially since you had asked me at one time what I believe on this topic, and I haven't as yet gotten back to you. You can consider this email my reply. So feel free to read this email and reply to it whenever you want to and have the time. It ended up becoming a very long email. I divided the email into various subpoints. That way, if you need to take a break from reading the email, you can stop at one of the sections of the email and continue reading from there later. Each section is marked by a heading, like the heading you can see just below. Enjoy! Opening Thoughts First of all, I believe water baptism is still a practice that should be participated in today. I feel like I understand a good bit of the arguments proposed by the Grace Gospel Fellowship to say that water baptism has been done away with, but the arguments to me seem to be taking things out of context. Is Paul speaking against water baptism in 1 Corinthians? One of the main passages used in order to say that water baptism is no longer a part of our practice as members of the body of Christ is found within 1 Corinthians 1, 10 through 17. Let's hear what Paul says. Now, brethren, I am pleading with you through the name of our Lord Jesus Christ in order that you all should speak the same thing and there should be no splits among you. But you should have been framed already in the same mind and in the same viewpoint. For it was indicated to me concerning you, my brethren, by the household of Chloe, that strifes are among you. Now I am saying this, that each of you says, I am indeed of Paul, but I am indeed of Apollos, but I am indeed of Cephas, but I am indeed of Christ. Has Christ been divided? Paul was not crucified on your behalf, was he? Or were you immersed into the name of Paul? I give thanks to God that I immersed none of you except Crispus and Gaius, in order that not anyone might say that I immersed you into my own name. And I also immersed the household of Stephanus. Furthermore, I do not know if I immersed any other. For Christ sent me not to immerse, but to proclaim the good news, not in wisdom of speech, that the cross of Christ might not be made void. Or, in another simple translation, My dear friends, as a follower of our Lord Jesus Christ, I beg you to get along with each other. Don't take sides. Always try to agree in what you think. Several people from Chloe's family have already reported to me that you keep arguing with each other. They have said that some of you claim to follow me, while others claim to follow Apollos or Peter or Christ. Has Christ been divided up? Was I nailed to a cross for you? Were you baptized in my name? I thank God that I didn't baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius. Not one of you can say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize that family of Stephanus, but I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. Christ did not send me to baptize. He sent me to tell the good news without using big words that would make the cross of Christ lose its power. What is Paul saying? Well, we'll get to that in a second. But what do the ones who say there is no water baptism tend to focus on? They like to point out the phrase at the very end, Christ did not send me to baptize. In focusing on this sentence, what is their conclusion? They use this remark from Paul in order to say that we should no longer water baptize people. But what is the truth? Paul did baptize a number of the Corinthians. Baptizing wasn't his focus, preaching the gospel was, but he had nonetheless not given up, not given up on baptizing people. What else do we see? 
those Paul did not personally baptize were still baptized by other people. In Acts 18, we read about Paul's visit to these people of Corinth before they were Christians. Paul was in Corinth preaching the good news to them. Some dispensationalists would probably prefer if Acts 18.8 read, Many of the Corinthians, when they heard, believed, period. But this is not what we read. Instead, the book of Acts contains these words, Many of the Corinthians, when they heard, believed, and were baptized. These Corinthians who believed and were baptized were the same group of people Paul was addressing in his letter of 1 Corinthians. In other words, they had been baptized, even if Paul didn't personally baptize them. Baptism had certainly not been done away with for them. What might make this more striking, to show that water baptism is not merely a Jewish practice, is to read the preceding verses in Acts 18. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself to the preaching uh, Paul devoted himself to preaching the word and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah. When they resisted and blasphemed, he shock he he shook out his clothes and told them, "Your blood is on your own heads. I'm innocent." From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Paul had first started preaching to the Jews in the area, but when they were stubborn, he decided to go instead to preach to the Gentiles. Then we read, So he, Paul, left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord, along with his whole household. Many of the Corinthians, when they heard, believed and were baptized. So we see that Paul's remark in his letter of 1 Corinthians does not imply that water baptism is done away with, nor do we see that water baptism is only a Jewish practice. But in case we still have any hesitation regarding Paul's statement, Christ did not send me to baptize, let's hear what one of the early Christian writers had to say about this issue. This early Christian was named Tertullian. He lived from about 155 AD to 220 AD, so he was alive pretty near to the time of the apostles themselves. He was writing against the doctrine of a certain group called the Cainites, who rejected water baptism. This is some of what he had to say about the issue. But they, the Cainites, roll back an objection against water baptism from that apostle Paul himself, in that he said, For Christ sent me not to baptize, 1 Corinthians 1.17, as if by this argument baptism were done away. For if so, why did he baptize Gaius and Crispus and the house of Stephanus? However, even if Christ had not sent him to baptize, Yet he had given other apostles the precept to baptize. But these words were written to the Corinthians in regard of the circumstances of that particular time, seeing that schisms and dissensions were agitated among them, while one attributes everything to Paul, another to Apollos. For which reason the peacemaking apostle, for fear he should seem to claim all gifts for himself, says that he had been sent not to baptize, but to preach. For preaching is the prior thing, baptizing the posterior, that is, the thing which follows. Therefore, the preaching came first, but I think baptizing withal, that is, in addition, was lawful for him, was lawful to him to whom preaching was. This is also what I had previously noticed myself when I was reading the passage in 1 Corinthians. Paul was not saying, Christ didn't send me to baptize. Baptism is no longer for today. Rather, Paul was concerned regarding the amount of division going on in the church of Corinth. I follow Paul. Ah, but I follow Peter. Oh yeah, well I follow Jesus. He didn't want who baptized them to be used as a bragging right or and a cause of, for division. Paul was essentially saying, I sure am glad I didn't baptize very many of you because then you'd be claiming some kind of special connection to me. 
Think about it, friends. You weren't baptized in my name. You were baptized in Jesus' name. Jesus is who is important. In fact, Jesus didn't even send me to baptize. It doesn't matter who baptized you. My job is to preach the good news. Someone else can do the baptizing. If you read 1 Corinthians chapter 1 slowly enough, I think you will read it the same way. By the way, this is similar to how Jesus dealt with baptism. Quoting scripture. When Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard he was making and baptizing more disciples than John, though Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and went again to Galilee. John chapter 4. Even here, Jesus had been preaching, but he was not the one doing the baptizing. His disciples were doing the baptizing. So that's the first point. Paul's letter to the Corinthians doesn't make water baptism invalid for today. Is water baptism merely a Jewish rite? Okay, so what about this idea that we started to touch upon, that water baptism was a Jewish rite that has since been abolished with the coming of the new body of Christ? Well, when did the body of Christ start? Some of the dispensational groups will say something like, the body of Christ started in Acts 9 at Paul's conversion. But let's be more generous for the sake of argument and say that the body of Christ didn't come into existence until several chapters later. We're going to look at the 19th chapter of Acts. The 19th chapter of Acts. Surely, even if we pretend the body of Christ started very late, I think we can safely assume the body of Christ has been started by Acts 19. In fact, this is one chapter after chapter 18, where we were reading above about the conversion of the Gentile Corinthians after Paul's preaching to them. Here then is the passage. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions and came to Ephesus. He found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? No, they told him. We haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. We start off with an interesting question. Did these believers receive the Holy Spirit when they believed? The answer turns out to be no. So what was Paul's next question to them? Into what then were you baptized, he asked them. When Paul realized these believers had not yet received the Holy Spirit, his immediate thought was to check what kind of baptism they received. What was their reply? Into John's baptism, they replied. And what happened next? Paul said, John baptized with a baptism of repentance, telling the people that they should believe in the one who had come after him, that is, in Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. So, these believers who had received water baptism under John's ministry were baptized again into Jesus' name. Briefly, let's recap. Here were a bunch of believers living in, the, in a time period after the body of Christ had been established. They had believed, but they had not received the Holy Spirit. Why? Because they had only received the baptism which John the Baptist brought. They needed to be baptized into Jesus' name. Notice that Paul doesn't say, Oh, you received John's baptism? That was water baptism. Because of Jesus, we now receive spiritual baptism instead. Rather, he says that John's baptism was a baptism of repentance, turning away from sin and turning toward God, and that the whole point of John the Baptist and his ministry was to lead people to believe in Jesus. But it didn't stop at belief. The belief in Jesus led to baptism into Jesus. Here these believers had already been water baptized, but they got baptized again in Jesus' name because the baptism they had received before was more about repentance than about identifying with Jesus. So if anything, we don't see that water baptism has been done away with now that the body of Christ exists, but rather we see that water baptism has new meaning 
Now, water baptism isn't just about repentance, now it's about Jesus. This is clearly seen in Romans 6, 3 and 4, and context, in which Paul says, Or are you unaware that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too may walk in newness of life. So now, this act of going down into the water and rising up again is used as a means for us to identify with Jesus in his death and resurrection. Just as Jesus died, we die. Just as Jesus rose, we rise. Quoting Paul, For if we have been united with him in the likeness of his death, we will certainly also be in the likeness of his resurrection. So it becomes apparent that baptism is not merely a Jewish rite. It had connections with John the Baptist, who prepared the way for Jesus. And then, after Jesus' death and resurrection, baptism took on a new meaning of being united with Jesus in his death and resurrection. Hence, why those who had received John's baptism later had to receive baptism into Jesus' name. 1. We have seen so far that Paul's letter to the Corinthians doesn't invalidate water baptism. 2. We've also seen that water baptism wasn't merely a Jewish rite, but it became a means of identifying with Jesus' death and resurrection. The Natural Order of Events and Salvation Now, there are still a couple of verses that some people use to do away with water baptism. These are 1 Corinthians 12.13 and Ephesians 4.5 paired together. We'll look at these verses later. But first, I want to examine this question. What was the natural order of events that took place when a person came to faith in Jesus? To answer this question, let's return to our passage in Acts 19 regarding the believers who had not yet received the Holy Spirit. What happened to them after they had been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus? Let's back up a little bit in our passage for context so we don't forget what had happened, and then we'll keep reading. But Paul said, John indeed immersed in the immersion of repentance, saying to the people in order that they should believe into the one who is coming after him, that this is into the Christ Jesus. Now having heard this, they were immersed into the name of the Lord Jesus. And after Paul laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they were speaking in foreign languages and were prophesying. The order was this. They repented and believed. The belief part is attested to in verse 2. They were baptized slash immersed into the name of the Lord Jesus. They received the Holy Spirit after Paul laid his hands on them. I also want to take note that this was not some goofy practice that the other apostles were practicing in the early part of the book of Acts to Jewish believers. Rather, this was Paul, the apostle of the Gentiles, telling these Gentile believers over halfway into the book of Acts that they needed to be baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus, even after they'd already believed. Again, this was Paul, the apostle of the Gentiles, who laid his own hands upon these Gentile believers so that they would receive the Holy Spirit, whom they had not yet received, even after believing the good news. If you think about this, Paul gave a high importance to baptism. He wouldn't even place his hands upon these believers so they could receive the Holy Spirit until after they had been baptized into Jesus' name. And think about it. These believers had already been baptized under John's baptism. But Paul didn't think this was good enough. He wanted them baptized in Jesus' name. So, that was the order in Acts 19. Repentance and belief, baptism, receiving the Holy Spirit. If we go back earlier into the book of Acts, to chapter 8, we actually see a very similar order of events. Quoting the scripture. 
Now after the apostles who were in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, that is, they believed, they sent Peter and John to them, who came down and prayed concerning them, so that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he, the Holy Spirit, was not yet falling upon any of them, but they were only being immersed into the name of the Christ Jesus. Then they were laying their hands upon them, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. Acts 8. Again, they believed the message, they were baptized into the name of Christ Jesus, then they received the Holy Spirit after Peter and John laid their hands on them. What we read before in Acts 19 was that the believers hadn't received the Holy Spirit because they had not yet been baptized into the name of Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ. But here in Acts 8, the believers hadn't received the Holy Spirit because no one had yet laid hands upon them and prayed for them to receive the Holy Spirit. But either way, the order of events is virtually the same both in chapter 8 and chapter 19. Repentance and belief, baptism into Jesus' name, receiving the Holy Spirit after someone laid hands on them slash prayed for them. Now, there is one exception to this order. It happens in Acts 18. Uh, sorry, in Acts 10. In Acts 10, we read about Cornelius, a Gentile centurion. He feared God and prayed to him and gave money to the poor. One day he was fasting and praying, and a messenger from God came to him and told him to send for Simon Peter. Peter comes to him after receiving the vision with the unclean animals, about which God says, Don't call anything unclean which God has made clean. And because Peter had received the vision, he realizes he shouldn't call the Gentiles unclean. Peter began speaking to all the Gentiles who were gathered there to hear what God wants to say to them, and says, In truth, I comprehend that God is not one who shows favoritism, but in every nation, he who fears him and his working righteousness is acceptable to him. The word which he sent to the sons of Israel, proclaiming the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, this one is Lord of all. To this one, Jesus, all the prophets are testifying that through his name, everyone, the one believing in him, is to receive forgiveness of sins. So Peter tells these Gentiles that through faith in Jesus, they can receive forgiveness, no matter what nation they come from. What happens next? While Peter is still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all the ones hearing the word. The Holy Spirit came on the Gentiles. Then what? And the believing ones from the circumcision, that is the Jews, were astonished as many as came together with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had also been poured out upon the Gentiles. The Jews were very surprised that Gentiles had received the Holy Spirit. So what did they do? Then Peter answered, is anyone able to forbid the water for these not to be immersed, who received the Holy Spirit even as we did? And he commanded them to be immersed in the name of the Lord. When Peter sees that God is willing to accept Gentiles on the basis of their own faith, and not on the basis of becoming a Jew, he says these Gentile believers need to be baptized in Jesus' name. So. In this case, the order of events was belief in Jesus, receiving the Holy Spirit, which surprised the Jews, baptism into Jesus' name. I would like to point out that Peter verifies that baptism into Jesus' name means water baptism, because he specifically says that no one is able to forbid the water for them to be immersed. And it seems evident why the order of events was different in this case. 
baptism taking place after receiving the Holy Spirit. The Jews likely would not have baptized the Gentiles without some kind of proof of their acceptance by God. This becomes perhaps more clear when we look at what happens in the next chapter. Peter comes back home and the Jews confront him. And when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the ones from the circumcision, Jews, were arguing with him saying, you entered to men having uncircumcision, that is the Gentiles, and ate together with them. So Peter explains the whole story of what happened and concludes by saying, now while I was beginning to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, the Gentiles, just like upon us, the Jews, also at the beginning. Now I was reminded of the declaration of the Lord, how he said, John indeed immersed in water, but you will be immersed in the Holy Spirit. Therefore, if God gave to them the equal gift, that is the Holy Spirit, like he also did to us after we believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ, now who is I that I am, am able to forbid God? But having heard these things, they, the Jews, were quiet and glorifying God, saying, Consequently, God gave also repentance to the Gentiles into life. So the Jews knew God had accepted the Gentiles based upon the fact that the Gentiles had now received the Holy Spirit, just like the Jewish believers had received the Holy Spirit. Notice Paul's remark after this. Uh, notice Peter's remark after this. Who was I that I am able to forbid God? It is very similar to his remark in the previous chapter. Is anyone able to forbid the water for these not to be immersed who received the Holy Spirit even as we did? So part of God's order of events in bringing people back to himself is to have them water baptized into the name of Jesus Christ. Normally this happens before receiving the Holy Spirit. But in this special instance, the first time Gentile believers were ever accepted by God to the extent that God gave them his Holy Spirit, in this special situation, water baptism happened after receiving the Holy Spirit in order to show the Jews that it was okay to baptize the Gentiles. God accepted them. But in the times after this, when Gentiles came to faith in Jesus, their water baptism took place upon their faith before receiving the Holy Spirit. At least, this is what we see whenever the scriptures specifically tell us when they received the Holy Spirit. As we've already seen in Acts 18 and 19. Examples of those who were baptized upon their faith. Lydia from Thyatira, a Greek city, Acts 16. The jailer in Philippi, a Greek city. Paul and Silas had told him the good news, Acts 16. I guess I should specifically say the verse numbers. Lydia was verses 14 and 15 of chapter 16. And uh, the jailer in Philippi was verses 25 through 34, particularly verse 33 of chapter 16. We already saw the Corinthians. Cor Corinth is another Greek city, are an example. Acts 18, 8 in context. But do you know who else is an example? The Apostle Paul. As Paul recounted the story from Acts 22. Now a certain one named Ananias came to me, and having stood by me, said to me, the God of our fathers assigned you to know his will and to see the righteous one, that is Jesus, and to hear a voice from his mouth, because you will be a witness for him to all men of what things you have seen and heard. And now, why are you hesitating? After you've stood up, be immersed and fully wash away your sins, having called upon the name of the Lord. So even Paul is an example of someone who is baptized upon his faith. We've seen then that the natural order of events for people coming to faith in the Lord is this, repentance from sin and belief in Jesus, 
baptism into Jesus' name, receiving the Holy Spirit after being prayed for or having uh, slash having hands laid on you. What is the point of water baptism? Now, I'm still going to talk about those two scriptures that are sometimes used to support the view that water baptism has been done away with, but before I do, I want to ask another question. If all of this is the case, that is, one, if Paul's letter to the Corinthians doesn't invalidate water baptism, two, and if baptism isn't just a Jewish rite, but a means of identifying with Jesus' death and resurrection, three, and if the natural order of events, repentance and belief, baptism, receiving the Holy Spirit, includes water baptism, if all of this is so, what is the point of water baptism? Why be baptized? What is the purpose of such a seemingly strange practice of dunking someone in water? Let's see what the scriptures say. But first, what do people say is the purpose of water baptism? People often say that water baptism is an outward sign of an inward reality. They say that being baptized is a way to make your faith public, to show others that you are a Christian now, to make a declaration of your faith, to witness to others. Is this what the scriptures say? Let's find out. First of all, let's skip past the accounts in Scripture of people being water baptized under John the Baptist ministry, since his baptism was a different baptism than we find after Jesus died. Let's specifically focus on the passages dealing with baptism after people started talking about baptism in Jesus' name. What is the first occurrence of people talking about baptism in Jesus' name? Acts 2. Now Peter said to them, Repent, and let each one of you be immersed in the name of Jesus Christ into the forgiveness of your sins, and you will be receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you, and to your children, and to all the ones that are far off, as many as the Lord our God would call. Acts 2, 38 and 39. Notice, the whole order of events is basically here in this passage. Repentance, with faith already having been demonstrated in the preceding verses, baptism slash immersion into Jesus' name, and receiving the Holy Spirit. Also notice that this promise is extended to all the ones at afar off, as many as the Lord our God would call as we've seen in Acts 10 with Cornelius and the rest of the Gentiles present with him, and from that point onward in the book of Acts, this statement came to apply even to Gentiles. The Gentiles, too, were to be immersed in the name of Jesus and receive the Holy Spirit. So, what does this passage say is the purpose of being baptized? Well, at face value, I see be immersed in the name of Jesus Christ into the forgiveness of your sins. Being immersed in Jesus' name in this passage seems to be tied to having your sins forgiven. Is that so? That could seem like a strange notion. But let's hold off on judgment for a moment, and let's see what else the Bible says is the purpose of water baptism. Maybe we'll see more of the same thoughts. Maybe we'll see something different. Maybe this idea of a public testimony of our faith will be put forth by the scriptures. Let's keep reading and see. The next scripture I see that talks about why someone is baptized is Paul telling about his own conversion in Acts 22. We looked at this scripture just a bit ago. The passage concludes with these words from Ananias to Paul. And now, why are you hesitating? After you've stood up, be immersed, and fully wash away your sins, having called upon the name of the Lord. Now this sounds strange, yeah? Being baptized and washing away your sins? But it's what Ananias told Paul to do. And it matches what Peter told the crowd to do in Acts 2. Be immersed in the name of Jesus Christ into the forgiveness of your sins. What else do the scriptures say? Mm 
This is uh, Peter speaking in 1 Peter 3, 18 through 21. Christ also suffered once for all concerning our sins, the righteous on behalf of the unrighteous, in order that he might lead you to God, having indeed been slain in the flesh, but was given life in the spirit, in which also traveling he preached to the spirits in prison while they were previously disobedient, when the patience of God was waiting in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, this is eight souls, were saved through water, which is our counterpart, immersion, saves us also now. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the demand of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In another translation, Christ died for sins once and for all, a good man on behalf of sinners, in order to lead you to God. He was put to death physically, but made alive spiritually. And in his spiritual existence, he went and preached to the imprisoned spirits. These were the spirits of those who had not obeyed God when he waited patiently during the days that Noah was building his boat. The few people in the boat, eight in all, were saved by the water, which was a symbol pointing to baptism, which now saves you. It is not the washing off of bodily dirt, but the promise made to God from a good conscience. It saves you through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So what does Peter say here? He says that Noah and his family being saved through the water of the flood was a picture pointing to the water of baptism, which now saves us through Jesus' resurrection. He specifically adds that it's not just about washing dirt off of your body, that is, getting dunked in water in and of itself won't do you any good. It's about asking God for a clean conscience. And he also points out that the reason water baptism does us any good is because of Jesus' resurrection. Okay, so that was Peter talking. But what about Paul? What does he have to say about this? Colossians 2, 12 to 13. You have been buried with, together with him, Christ, in the immersion, in which you were also raised up together with him through the faith from the working of God, who raised him up from the dead. And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of, your, of the flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all the trespasses. In another translation again. For when you were baptized, you were buried with Christ. And in baptism, you were also raised with Christ through your faith in the active power of God, who raised him from death. You were at one time spiritually dead because of your sins and because you were Gentiles without the law. But God has now brought you to life with Christ. God forgave us all our sins. Paul says that we were buried with Christ and raised up with Christ in the immersion, that is, in being baptized into Jesus' name. He says this happens through faith in God's power. In other words, through faith that God's power that raised Christ from the dead will also bring us new life in that moment. Maybe this is why Paul said in Romans 6, which we read before, that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Maybe this is why Paul said, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may li live a new life. What else does Paul say about baptism? Galatians 3, 26 and 27. For you are all sons of God through the faith in Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus. For as many as were immersed into Christ, you have clothed yourselves with Christ. Here again, Paul says that faith and immersion go hand in hand. We are saved through faith in Christ, and we manifest that faith, I suppose you could say, 
by being immersed into Christ. When we are immersed into Christ, we clothe ourselves with Christ. We somehow identify with Jesus and participate in his death and resurrection, as the other passages from Romans and Colossians say, by being immersed in his name. Maybe this makes sense why all of the Corinthians who accepted Paul's message believed and were baptized, Acts 18.8. Being baptized is a natural extension of faith in Christ. So, all in all, what do the scriptures say about baptism into Jesus' name? Do the scriptures say anything about a public testimony? Rather, what I see is that baptism is linked to washing away sins, being buried and raised with Christ, clothing ourselves with Christ. It seems to be a natural extension of faith. Because it takes faith to believe that God will work in that moment of baptism to accomplish those things. What did the early Christians say about baptism? Now, if all of this seems like a stretch, perhaps I'm reading the scripture passages too literally. Let's also see what the early Christians had to say about baptism. If it is, as some people say, that the Apostle Paul was telling people we don't need to get baptized anymore, then surely the early Christians living just after the time of Paul would have stopped baptizing people, right? Tertullian, who I mentioned before, he lived between 155 and 220 AD, started off a treatise on baptism with these words. Happy is our sacrament of water, that is, baptism in that, by washing away the sins of our earlier blindness, we are set free and admitted into eternal life. A viper of the Cainite heresy has carried away a number, a great number with her vo most venomous doctrine, making it her first aim to destroy baptism, which is quite in accordance with nature, for vipers and asps and basilisks themselves generally do affect arid and waterless places. But we, little fishes, after the example of our ichthus, the early Christian fish symbol which represented Jesus, but we, little fishes, after the example of our ichthus, Jesus Christ, are born in water. Nor do we have safety in any other way than by permanently abiding in water. So that most monstrous creature, who had no right to teach even sound doctrine, knew full well how to kill the little fishes by taking them out of the water. Tertullian on Baptism, Chapter 1. That is quite a high, high regard for baptism. He says that baptism in water washes away sins. And he compares a heretical group called the Cainites to snakes. He says these snakes are trying to take Christians, who he compares to fishes, out of the water by destroying baptism. He says that if these snakes are successful in taking the fishes, Christians, out of the water, baptism, that these snakes will kill the little fishes. Goodness! This is quite opposite of what people nowadays say that Paul taught. It is quite opposite to people saying we no longer need baptism. But maybe this particular early Christian writer was just a lone ranger. Maybe his view was unusual and heretical. Let's see what some other early Christians had to say. Irenaeus lived between 130 and 202 AD, so he was alive even a little closer to the time of the apostles compared to Tertullian. It is said that Irenaeus was a disciple of Polycarp, who was a disciple of the apostle John. Irenaeus wrote a very long work titled Against Heresies in which he detailed the beliefs of the various heretics at the time. Different kinds of Gnostics and so forth, and refuted their heretical beliefs. While talking about a group of Gnostic heretics called the Marcosians, they followed the teaching of a man named Marcus, he had this to say. It happens that their tradition the tradition of the Marcosians, 
Respecting redemption is invisible and incomprehensible, as being the mother of things which are incomprehensible and invisible. And on this account, since it is fluctuating, it is impossible simply and all at once to make known its nature, for every one of them hands it down just as his own inclination prompts. Thus, there are as many schemes of redemption as there are teachers of these mystical opinions. And when we come to refute them, we shall show in its fitting place that this class of men have been instigated by Satan to a denial of that baptism, which is regeneration to God, and thus to a renunciation of the whole Christian faith. That's kind of a mouthful, but he basically says that these Marcosian heretics have as many views about redemption as they have teachers. Some of, the, some of these heretics believe one thing, some believe another. Whereas the true church at the time was basically in agreement. He says that at least some of these men were denying baptism. In so doing, they were doing Satan's work. He also says that baptism is regeneration to God. In other words, baptism is the means by which we are made new through our faith in Christ. He also says that to deny baptism is to renounce the whole Christian faith. Wow! We'll look at one more early Christian writer, and then we'll call it good as far as their witness is concerned. This is Justin Martyr. He lived between 100 and 165 AD, so he lived even closer to the time of the apostles than did Tertullian or Irenaeus. His writings are some of the earliest we have besides those of the apostles themselves. Justin Martyr wrote a long letter to the emperor in defense of the Christians and their practices. And toward the end of the, of the letter, he includes this section about Christian baptism. Quoting, I will also relate the manner in which we dedicated ourselves to God when we had been made new through Christ. Lest, if we omit this, we seem to be unfair in the explanation we are making. As many as are persuaded and believe that what we teach and say is true and undertake to be able to live accordingly are instructed to pray and to entreat God with fasting for the remission of their sins that are past, we praying and fasting with them. Then they are brought by us where there is water and are regenerated in the same manner in which we were ourselves regenerated. For in the name of God, the Father and Lord of the universe, and of our Savior Jesus Christ, and of the Holy Spirit, they then receive the washing with water. For Christ also said, Unless you be born again, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. John 3, 5. Now that it is impossible for those who have once been born to enter into their mother's wombs is manifest to all. And for this rite of baptism, we have learned from the apostles this reason. Since at our birth, we were born without our own knowledge or choice by our parents coming together and were brought up in bad habits and wicked training in order that we may not remain the children of necessity and of ignorance, but may become the children of choice and knowledge and may obtain in the water the remission of sins formerly committed, there is pronounced over him who chooses to be born again and has repented of his sins, the name of God the Father and Lord of the universe, and in the name of Jesus Christ, who was crucified under Pontius Pilate, and the in the name of the Holy Ghost, who through the prophets foretold all things about Jesus, he who is illuminated is washed. Justin Martyr, the first apology, chapter 61. Now, that was pretty long. Let's summarize. Justin Martyr says that those who heard their preaching and are persuaded by it and believe are told to pray and fast for God to forgive their sins. And the person who does the baptizing also fasts. Then the person who believed and repented of their sins is brought to the water. He says that the water is the place where the person is regenerated apparently the same word Irenaeus used, which means made new. He seems to equate this regeneration to being born again, regenerated, born again. And he quotes Jesus, who said that unless we are born again, we cannot enter the kingdom of God.
He even gives quite a picture that when we were first born, we had no say in the matter. It was all our parents doing. But now we can choose to be born again in the water by our faith in God, having our sins washed away because of our repentance. This is all done in the name of God the Father, our Savior Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. How did the scriptures compare with what the early Christians said? 1. Now, how can this be, though? Being born of water? Born again in baptism? Being regenerated in baptism? What do the scriptures say? Well, you may be surprised when you read this little bit from Paul to see how similar it sounds to what the early Christians just said. He saved us, not from any works done in righteousness which we practiced, but according to his mercy, through the full washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Titus 3.5 What? Here in another translation. Not from works and righteousness which we did, but according to his mercy he delivered us, through the bath of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Or of Holy Spirit. Titus 3.5 Paul literally says regeneration, like we read from the other early Christian writers, and he ties regeneration to this bath, or full washing. And in case there's any question what kind of full washing or bath is in view, here is the Greek word with its definition. G3067 in the Strong's, Lutron, from another Greek word, a bath. That is, figuratively, baptism, washing. That was Strong's definition, now the Thayer. Bathing, bath, the act of bathing. So, this is real water being referred to, a real bathing taking place. It is not merely a spiritual act. The definition even says that this word is used of baptism specifically. So Paul is saying that our regeneration, our being made new, happened when we took a bath, that is, when we were baptized. Two. But it's not just this concept of regeneration being connected to a bath, where Paul and Justin Martyr had similar things to say. There's another phrase Justin Martyr used, which Paul also uses. Here's what Justin Martyr said again. For in the name of God the Father and Lord of the universe, and of our Savior Jesus Christ, and of the Holy Spirit, they then receive the washing with water. And Paul said, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. Ephesians 5, 26, 27, uh, 25, 26. That sounds practically identical to me. I don't know about you, but before I looked into some of this, the whole phrase, washing with water, I took figuratively. That's not real water he's talking about, I might have said to myself. Let's see what a couple of Bible commentators have to say about this passage. Here's what Matthew Henry said when commenting on Paul's words here in Ephesians that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might endue all all his members with a principle of holiness and deliver them from the guilt, the pollution, and the dominion of sin. The instrumental means whereby this is effected are the instituted sacraments, particularly the washing of baptism and the preaching and reception of the gospel. Matthew Henry, Commentary on Ephesians 5. Or John Wesley had this to say, by the washing of water, in baptism, if, with the outward and visible sign, we receive the inward and spiritual grace. In other words, both of these commentators state that baptism is what is being talked about when the Apostle Paul mentions the phrase, washing with water. And this baptism is the means Christ uses to sanctify and cleanse us, the church, as the Apostle Paul said, so long as we receive this baptism in true faith and repentance. 
or as John Wesley says, so long as we receive the inward and spiritual grace. In other words, just getting wet without faith in God and without a real change of heart isn't going to do anything. So far, in comparing the early Christian writers to the scriptures, we've seen that the Apostle Paul uses the same language that Justin Martyr did in the words regeneration and washing with water, both in reference to water baptism. Three, but there's one more phrase the early Christian writers used that I want to look at. They specifically likened water baptism to being born again. This is a very common Christian phrase, and it is definitely scriptural, but I hadn't connected it to water baptism before. What did the early Christians, no, no, why did the early Christians connect born again to water baptism? What did the scriptures say? Here's what one of the early Christians, Irenaeus, who we heard before said. Here we will see what scripture passage ties these ideas together. Irenaeus starts off by quoting the Old Testament where Naaman was healed from his leprosy and then goes on from there. And dipped himself, says the scripture, seven times in Jordan, 2 Kings 5.14. It was not for nothing that Naaman of old, when suffering from leprosy, was purified upon his being baptized, but it served as, as an indication to us for as we are lepers in sin, we are made clean by means of the sacred water and invocation of the Lord from our old transgressions, being spiritually regenerated as newborn babes, even as the Lord has declared, unless a man be born again through water and the Spirit, he shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. John 3, 5. Irenaeus, Fragment 34. So, Irenaeus says that Naaman being dunked in the Jordan River seven times to cure his leprosy is a picture for us today about the power God can work in us through baptism to cleanse us from our sins as we call upon the name of the Lord. He says that in doing this, we become spiritually regenerated, just like newborn babies born again. In the same way that little babies are pure and innocent upon their birth, we too become clean again on the inside. And he ties this to Jesus' word that we must be born again of water, that is baptism, and spirit. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think I'd ever read that passage from Jesus about being born again of water so literally, so plainly, as to come up with the thought that he was talking about water baptism. It sounds so obvious when you put it together, but somehow I always wanted to take his words more figuratively. Hmm, born of water. What is he referring to? But this wasn't so veiled to the early Christians. Irenaeus isn't the only one who quotes this scripture in referring to water baptism. Our friend Tertullian also mentions this scripture. Quoting, Here then those miscreants, that is, the people wanting to do away with baptism, provoke questions. And so they say, Baptism is not necessary for them to whom faith is sufficient. For with all, Abraham pleased God by a sacrament of no faith, and of no water, but of faith. But, in all cases, it is the later things which have a conclusive force and the subsequent which prevail over the antecedent, the things prior. Grant that in days gone by there was salvation by means of bare faith before the passion and resurrection of the Lord. But now that faith has been enlarged and has become a faith which believes in his nativity, passion, and resurrection there has been an amplification added to the sacrament, viz. the sealing act of baptism, the clothing, in some sense, of the faith which, was bare, which before was bare, and which cannot exist now without its proper law. For the law of baptizing has been imposed, and the formula prescribed. Go, 
Jesus says, teach the nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The comparison with this law of that definition, unless a man have been reborn of water and spirit, he shall not enter into the kingdom of the heavens, John 3, 5, has tied faith to the necessity of baptism. Accordingly, all thereafter who became believers used to be baptized. Then it was too that Paul, when he believed, was baptized. And this is the meaning of the precept which the Lord had given him when smitten with the plague of loss of sight, saying, Arise and enter Damascus, and there shall be demonstrated to you what you ought to do. To it, be baptized, which was the only thing lacking to him. That point accepted, he had sufficiently learned and believed the Nazarene to be the Lord, the Son of God. Tertullian on Baptism, Chapter 13. Tertullian says that some people were arguing that faith by itself is enough, that baptism isn't necessary. These people were arguing this point by saying, Abraham didn't have to be baptized. Faith by itself was good enough for him. But, to, but Tertullian counters by saying that it is not the old way of things that is most applicable for us today, but the new way of things. Now we believe everything that has to do with Jesus, Tertullian says, his death, his life, death, and resurrection. And this is why we are baptized. Now our faith is sealed, brought to a climax of sorts, in baptism. Tertullian says, now there is a law of baptism. Jesus commanded it, both in the Great Commission and in his statement that no one can enter God's kingdom without being born of water and spirit. He goes so far as to say that all, everybody who became a believer was baptized. He says even the Apostle Paul believed and was baptized. I personally find it interesting that Tertullian mentions that water baptism is the new thing and that we ought to follow the new way of doing things rather than the old. This sounds very similar to me to what the dispensationalists say we ought to do. God works in different ways in different dispensations, and we need to follow the requirements of the current dispensation, not the old dispensation. Except the dispensationalists believe that baptism is the old thing that has been done away with, rather than the new thing that has been added, like Tertullian said. Quite the opposite perspective. So we see that being born again was tied to water baptism in the minds of the early Christians because of Jesus' word that we must be born of water and spirit. It is in water baptism, along with the receiving of the Holy Spirit to follow, that we are born again. So long as we have repented of our sins and have faith in the Lord Jesus, otherwise we are merely taking a bath. What about the two scriptures the GTF uses to do away with water baptism? I promised that I would talk about the two scriptures that the GGF uses to say that water baptism has been done away with. Here they are. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For also we were all immersed into one body in one spirit, whether Jews or Greeks, whether bond servants or freemen, and were all made to drink into one spirit. And... Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. There's one body and one spirit, just as you were also called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one immersion, one God and Father of all, the one over all and through all and in us all. Let's look at that first scripture in another translation to make the GTF argument more clear. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and were all given the one spirit to drink. So the argument goes like this. One, if the Holy Spirit is the one who baptizes us into the body of Christ, and two, 
if there is only one baptism, then surely water baptism is not the one baptism. Rather, spiritual baptism is the one baptism. Let's think on this. Where else in the scriptures do we hear of a spirit baptism that is different from water baptism? I can think of the few times in the Gospels where John the Baptist said Jesus would immerse people in the Holy Spirit. Immerse or baptize. After this, Jesus promises to fulfill this word. telling the disciples to stay in Jerusalem until the promise from the Father comes and they are baptized with the Holy Spirit. The fulfillment comes in Acts 2, when all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. The other examples take place in the passages we mentioned someplace, somewhere above, Acts 8 and Acts 19, when the believers were baptized then people prayed for them while laying hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> also, we see the Holy Spirit baptism. Also, we see Holy Spirit baptism taking place when Cornelius and his household received the Holy Spirit, the first Gentiles to receive the Holy Spirit in this way, and were baptized. Then it is made clear that baptism with the Holy Spirit is the same as receiving the Holy Spirit. We see this in Acts 11, when Peter recounts what had happened with Cornelius and the other Gentiles. He says, And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, the Gentiles, just as it had upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Comparing with Acts 10, we read, While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter said, Can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit, just as we have. So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Acts 10, 44 through 48. So the Holy Spirit falling, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and receiving the Holy Spirit are all the same thing. And when does this baptism of the Holy Spirit hap happen? In all cases, except that of Cornelius and his household, in order to show the Jews that it was okay to baptize Gentiles, receiving the Holy Spirit took place after water baptism in Jesus' name. Notice, by the way, that Peter, when the Gentiles received the Holy Spirit, remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If spiritual baptism was the one baptism of Ephesians 4, 5, and nothing else was needed, surely Peter would have given praise to God and let the Gentiles go on their way. If that were the case, then these Gentiles had just received the one baptism, the Holy Spirit baptism, the only baptism needed for today. But instead, Upon realizing that the Gentiles had received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Peter ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. In other words, Holy Spirit baptism was not all that was required. Water baptism was still needed. But how can this be? The scripture specifically said one baptism. How can there be a spirit baptism and a water baptism? Let's look again. Paul said, There is one body and one spirit. 
just as you were called to one hope at your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. Do you see it? Paul doesn't have to mention Holy Spirit baptism as such because he already mentioned the Holy Spirit. One Spirit. There is one Spirit and one baptism or immersion. Water baptism. This is exactly the same as what Jesus said. We need to be born of water and spirit. That is, we need to be immersed or baptized in water and receive the Holy Spirit. This is how we are born again. There is no contradiction. Physical and spiritual. But, one might ask, baptism is physical. How can it affect a spiritual change? One might also ask how the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil could open Adam and Eve's eyes so they knew they were naked, and how this fruit also brought about spiritual death and separation from God. Surely this was a physical fruit, but it affected a, sp uh, but it affected a spiritual change, or spiritual change. Genesis 3. One might also ask how partaking of communion was causing some of the believers in Corinth to become weak, sick, and even die, even though this was ordinary bread and wine they were consuming. It should not have brought death to their bodies if the physical properties of the bread and wine were the only contributing factors. 1 Corinthians 11. One might ask why it was that whenever Moses raised his hands in the battle against the Amalekites, the Israelites would win the battle. But whenever Moses lowered his hands, the Amalekites would win the battle. How could such a simple physical action be tied to the Israelites' success or failure? Exodus 17. One might ask why it was that the amount of victory the king in 2 Kings 13 was going to have over the Arameans was determined by how many times he struck an arrow to the ground. Elisha told him that if he, if he had struck the ground five or six times with the arrow, he would have completely won the victory. But since he only struck the ground three times, he was only going to win three battles. 2 Kings 13. Why should these seemingly insignificant physical events bring about such huge changes, even over matters that had nothing to do with the physical objects involved? Because God is fond of using the weak things to shame the strong and the foolish things to shame the wise. 1 Corinthians 1.27 in context. He can even use simple physical objects and actions to effect large changes even spiritual changes. As Tertullian said, the act of baptism itself too is carnal, that is, it involves the physical body, in that we are plunged in water, but the effect spiritual, in that we are freed from sins. Summary. So in summary, I believe water baptism is still for believers today. The arguments proposed by the GGF and similar groups seem to me to take a small number of scriptures out of context in order to prove their point. And they also seem to ignore the witness of the early church as if the early Christians were holding on to traditions that God and Paul wanted them to let go of. I personally think the early Christians living much closer to the time of the apostles, including Paul, and living in that culture and having Greek as their native tongue, probably understood the teaching of Paul and Jesus and the other apostles better than we do today, many centuries removed of a different culture and speaking a different language. Paul's writings don't come across to me as if he was saying water baptism had passed away, not even his remark that he, was, that he wasn't sent to baptize, because that whole church of Corinth had been baptized by somebody or another. Nor do I see the one baptism argument as nullifying water baptism, 
since everyone who received the Holy Spirit, spirit baptism, also received water baptism. And the scripture passage itself not only says one baptism, but also one spirit. The one baptism is water baptism, and the baptism with the Holy Spirit is covered under the heading of one spirit. So rather than speaking against water baptism, Paul and the other writers of scripture seem to have quite a high view of baptism, tying baptism to washing away sins, being regenerated, being born again, being saved, clothing ourselves with Christ, and being united with Jesus in his death and resurrection. And all of this is right in line with what the early Christians after them also believed and taught. But all of this is in great contrast to the prevailing view that baptism is merely an outward sign of an inward reality, or that baptism is how you tell others about your faith. Rather, in actuality, baptism actually does something, or rather, God does something in us through baptism. We must always remember, though, that getting wet in and of itself is entirely fruitless without faith in the Lord Jesus. This is where some churches have gone astray, thinking that just because, for example, a baby is dunked in water, that that baby is now on its way to heaven. No! There needs to be a real repentance of sins, which an infant can't do. There needs to be a true faith in Jesus, which an infant can't have. Faith is what brings us to the water. Trusting God will use that water, not to wash our bodies, but to wash our sins away. To give us a clean conscience, to make us pure and fresh like newborn babies again. Water baptism gives us a clear cutoff point from our past, just like the Israelites experienced when Pharaoh and his army were drowned in the waters of the Red Sea. So too, our past is washed away in baptism, and our old life is buried with Christ, all by the mighty hand of God. Because of all of this, it should be plain that water baptism is not, a, not just a Jewish practice. They knew nothing of dying with Christ and rising again with him in baptism. Yes, the baptism Jesus instituted by dying and rising again is different from the baptism John the Baptist performed. And we have a number of examples of Gentiles being baptized well into the book of Acts. If baptism were a Jewish rite, the Christians should have stopped baptizing Gentiles. After all, the Gentile believers were free from just about every obligation of the Jewish law. See Acts 15 and Acts 21-25. But they didn't stop baptizing Gentiles. Gentile believers continued to be baptized. If baptism was supposed to stop, supposed to have stopped being performed, someone missed the memo. So for Jews and Gentiles, we see the natural order of events for those who are beginning to follow the Lord are these repentance of sins and faith in the Lord Jesus, being immersed in water in Jesus' name, receiving the Holy Spirit after a Christian lays their hands on them and prays for them. And if anyone wonders how it is that God can use water to make someone new on the inside, just think about how God made the world in the beginning. The Spirit of God hovered over the waters. It is the same today. Oh, and that's Genesis 1-2. It is the same today. The Spirit of God hovers over the waters of baptism. And that Spirit of God is ready to descend upon the baptized person just as he descended upon our Lord Jesus in the form of a dove after his baptism as the Lord was praying. Luke 3, 21 and 22. Conclusion. By now, I suppose you have a good summation of what I believe about water baptism. I hope this has been a helpful email and not too shocking of one. When I look at the vast amount of scripture in the Bible regarding water baptism, 
and I look at the testimony of the early Christians living near to the time of the apostles, it seems far-fetched to me that water baptism is no longer applicable for believers today. I would rather agree with the bulk of scripture than take a handful of verses out of context to say that water baptism has passed away. So those are my thoughts, Ryan. So there you have it. There was my little paper, as it were, <laughs> email really, on baptism. And uh, maybe a bit shocking. I know a lot of these things were shocking to me when I first heard them. But uh, as it seems to me, it really is um, what the Bible says and what the early Christians said. And um, I'd really much rather side with what the Bible says and what the Christians living much closer to the time of Jesus said as opposed to the modern day theologies and philosophies of people. And I'm certainly not uh, as smart as the people back then. So hope you've enjoyed and I'll catch you all later. Bye-bye.